Good morning, everyone. So we're delighted to welcome Sarah Chalice with us today. So Sarah is an award-winning author and motivational speaker. She's going to be doing a Carers Masterclass with us this morning, which is very exciting. So if I can hand straight over to you, Sarah. That's lovely. Right. Thank you so much, Sue. And thank you for inviting me, Jackie and Sue, for this morning. It's great to see everybody. So thank you for taking the, the time and the effort today. Uh, I want you to enjoy it as well. So sit back and, and relax. What I'm going to do firstly is share my story and then share some slides. Uh, mm -hmm. to help to improve your health and well-being um, if you can maybe put it on mute because I know how it is we sometimes forget and then you kind of bang your cup down and stuff because I do that too uh, that would be great and uh, firstly um, you know care is at the at the moment you know we're not as valued as we'd like to be and um, you know we're putting it out there to the government we keep need to banging that drum and let them know and I know it's been even harder with um, all that's been happening with the virus um, so my heart goes out to you all you know we're isolated at the best of times so it's been very difficult times challenging times I know and you know as John Lennon said uh, many years ago life happens when you're making other plans and we certainly experience that don't we so let me take you back to nearly 20 years ago it is Tuesday the 21st of December 1999 and I've just got a job in London and I'm so excited I've I'm come here to live and to work and picture the scene I'm on the 26th floor of the NatWest Tower. Huge views overlooking the city. I'm in the design team and this is where my life's gonna start. So I've only been there for a few days. I'm sat at the desk, just going through the brand guidelines. Two other girls in my office, keep looking out at the beautiful view and I can smell the coffee and the tapping of the, of the laptops. And I hear some footsteps behind me and I look up and there he is. It's Neil. He's six foot four, the size and stature of a rugby player, cheeky smile, and he's our, our supplier to our design team. He's brought us all in wine for Christmas. You all right there, Sarah? Got a little something you might like. Man after my own heart. Anyway, every now and again, he takes our, our little group of women out for a bit of bite to eat, and I get to know him better. He oozes confidence really great, really funny, and always entertaining. And then a little while later, he asked me out and we start dating and we're having a great time. He's got loads of mates, really popular, even captain of Hampstead Rugby Club. And actually during this time, and it's only been weeks, he says, he thinks I'm the one. Whoa, hang on a minute, Neil, I've not been in London long, but I do remember the day we're driving over Tower Bridge together in his car. And I remember just gazing across and looking at Neil. And I love Tower Bridge. And I said, you know what, Neil? I think I could spend the rest of my life with you. I had no idea where that came from, by the way. He looked straight back at me. And I could spend the rest of my life with you. By the time we come off the bridge, we were on this journey together. Anyway, during this time, he'd been looking like funny pins and needles down one side, really nasty headaches. And then finally, he was slurring, slurring his speech and drinking again, Neil. But then it'd been a few days and he couldn't really get off the sofa. I ended up calling an ambulance, you know, just in case. Got him to hospital and they were doing all these checks on him. And then right into the early hours of the morning, they were doing scans and things. I went home to get some shut eye and left him there in their cables. Next morning, I wake up and... I get a call from the hospital. Can I, can I come in immediately? They've done a brain scan. Why me? Brain scan is a bit tall order. Anyway, I turn up at the hospital. There's Neil. He's looking great, much better. Colour in his cheeks. He's on a ward of six men. And as he sat there, he's beaming smile. I give him a hug and I go and sat on the bed with him. And only about five minutes later, the doctor arrives. He's a little, little guy, I'd say, in his kind of 60s. He's got these little half moon specks and white hair. He's like a little mad professor, actually. He's got Neil's notes under his arm and he just pulls the curtain round quietly. Oh, Mr. Chalice, my, we've got your scan result for your brain here. Um, I'm afraid it's not good news. 
it looks like it's either a brain tumor or brain cancer. Oh my God. Neil and I look at each other and hold each other tightly. Neil hadn't been to the doctor in 14 years. We just weren't expecting this at all. We both had tears and we hugged each other. Don't worry, Neil, I'm here for you. We were on this journey together. Anyway, Neil has a long operation to remove a large brain tumor and then six months of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And then by the end of all that, he gets a call. Oh, he's all clear. His neurosurgeon's just spoken to him. So we get on with our lives thinking that's it. We're good, we're good to go. And that whole year we enjoy life, getting back on track, going out for work and then holidays. Following Christmas morning, Neil proposes to me and we look forward to getting married, I don't know, in a year or so. I'm never in any rush. But only a few weeks after he proposes to me, unfortunately, He's, he started to get those pins and needles, brings his scan forward, but this time, sadly, his hunch is right. Not only has the tumor returned, it's inoperable. We come home quietly from the hospital and we stood here in the dining room. Neil gazes down at me. Sarah, you don't have to marry me. I look straight back at Neil. Stuff the cancer, Neil. We will make the most of what we have. I refuse to let cancer to dictate, dictate our lives. You know, we're here to live and make the most. So we decided to bring the wedding forward and saw it as a huge celebration with all our friends and family. It was a great occasion. But Neil had five more years of chemotherapy. It's amazing he lasted that long for that in itself. And by the end of it, because he had a number of tumors in his head, he was having falls. He's a big, heavy guy, he's like 17 stone, really big. And I've given up my job in the city and my career to care for him full time. Now, a few years after that, Neil then has a mini stroke. It's not a big one. But it, because of all that's been going on in his head, it really scuppers us. Doctors to say at the hospital, he's a do not resuscitate. I realize that they're giving up on him and I want to bring him back home. At least I want him to die at home. I don't want him there. So he ends up in a hospital bed in our living room, unable to speak with a peg feeding tube. My, my larger than life husband has been reduced to not much more than a body in a bed. And it's a tragedy for both of us because as Neil is slowly losing his life, I feel like I am losing mine. But you get on with it, don't you? That's what you do. That's all you can do. You've got to be there for your loved one. Make sure that they're okay. And I describe it like this, although it's Neil, the brain tumor in his head, I am waking up to brain cancer every day may not be in my head, but it's affecting every area of my life. And I'm also feeling a lot more you know, isolated and lonely, which you might be feeling as well. And I'm also making myself solely responsible for Neil's life, to all order for a man who could be gone at any moment. And it's been happening for years and years. And if you do get out, well, you feel guilty, don't you? I mean, how dare you go out and enjoy yourself? Shouldn't you be at home? caring for your loved one. But you know what? I do love a glass of Prosecco of an evening. What do you do to distract yourself? Some nights it's the glass, some nights it's the bottle. I can get an out for an evening and see my mates. Well, I can drink my own body weight in fizz. I'm caning it. And if you see me on Facebook, well, I've always got a brave face on, you know, making sure that everybody thinks that I'm happy and bubbly. And I've always got a drink in my hand. I don't want to let them know what's going on here. Or should I call it fake book? Anyway, I soldier on regardless, as we do. I ignore my own feelings, my own health, as a lot of us do. Maybe you are too. And I suppress my emotions, which scuppers me. But finally, the cracks start to show. First off, I end up with a really bad chest infection and antibiotics are not touching it. I have it for months and months. 
Finally, I end up with MRSA infection in both ears, brought home by Neil when he came home from the hospital. And then both Neil and I are going back and forth from hospital. We make a right pair. And then finally, my good friend Reagan comes to look after Neil for the day while I'm back at hospital. Now, Reagan is my best friend. She's got a real heart of gold, long auburn hair, South African. And as I'm at hospital all day, she's here caring for him with help with paid carers hoisting him into the wheelchair and back again. And then finally, I come home that evening and she greets me at the door. And this is exactly what she says. Well, I hope you've got a pat of butter for your bottom. What? Because I'm going to smack it. I had no idea what you do. Why are you keeping this a secret? I'm not Reagan. You just get on with it, don't you? I mean, what's the point in telling others? What are they going to do about it? Well, I've only been here a day and I'm exhausted. No wonder you're ill. Haven't you spoken to family? <sighs> you know what I have, Reagan, but... You know, for many of us as carers, and you may find that too, if you're the one who steps up to the mark of caring, others will kind of step back and kind of leave it, leave you to it. Well, you can't keep going like this. Who else can you call? Ghostbusters? No. Well, you know what? I could ring Julia, head nurse at our local hospice. Neil goes there for the day centre. I'll give her a ring tomorrow and see what she suggests. So that's what I do the next day. I finally ask for help and place that call. Hey, Julia. Yes, yeah, Sarah. No, it's not about Neil. Um, it's about me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've not been, well, I've been caring for Neil for a long time, but I, I'm just not coping anymore. And I've been ill for months. Yeah. And you know what? I just don't get, I usually go out running or walking for a bit of exercise to make myself feel better. Well, I'm too ill to do any of that. And I don't see my mates anymore. And I feel quite lonely and isolated. I feel quite tearful, even giving up drinking. <laughs> you know, that's a tall order for me. What's that? You've been expecting this call. Yeah, I have been caring for over 10 years. Yeah. What's that? Emergency respite. Neil can go in for a couple of weeks. Give me a break so I can recoup. That would be wonderful, Julia. You'll give me a call later today and let me know where, where and when. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Julia had noticed I wasn't coping, but I actually thought I was coping when I hadn't been for a long time. Anyway, a few days later, Neil's in at St. David's in Ealing, care home, and I then take myself on a silent retreat of all things. Anybody here been on a silent retreat? Probably not. Oh, oh, there's a nod from Roz. Thank you, Roz. So yeah, I, I've never been on one, but I know I need something quite strong. A couple of like hot stone massages aren't gonna sort this out. I'm mentally and physically flawed. I'm not very good at all. So anyway, take myself down there. Question is, can I shut up for five days? You'd be surprised. Anyway. I've only been there for a few days on the silent retreat. I'm getting better sleep because a lot of us don't sleep well, do we? Because you're always on call and worrying and stressing even into the early hours. But I'm feeling better. My chest is feeling better, my throat. And then picture the scene. There's about 35 of us in a hall. It's kind of an ex-convent, actually, guy house down in Devon. And we're all sat cross-legged, some on chairs. Oh, just feeling better, in a peace quiet, relaxed, let a night sleep. But as I sit there, I start to think of those certain family and friends who could have been there for me and Neil, but instead of being judging us and putting on me. And I get this anger come up. And as I feel angry, this feeling, this horrible negative feeling, I feel this pain in my chest and a vice-like grip around my neck. And it happens in less than a second. <gasps> I had no idea my thoughts and my feelings were really impacting my health and my body. Got to change what I'm thinking. And with certain family who've been causing me a lot of grief, this is how I saw it. If they turn up at our front door again, great. If they never turn up again, great. I actually emotionally let them go. And what I also realized 
not only was I last on the list, I wasn't even on the list. It was time to make some changes. So a few weeks later, I'm back at home caring for Neil, but this time I'm also caring for myself. It takes a while for me to get my health back. It's been quite, quite some time, but I'm starting to enjoy life again, plan my days better. And when I do see my friends, I don't feel guilty. I need that quality time. We do, don't we? Now, a few months later after that, I'm at, um, it's our local charity, INS Down the Road Neuro Charity. I'm at their quiz night and I've wheeled Neil in and we're sat in this big hall. And as we sat at the table with a few friends, there is a bald woman in her 60s comes running towards me. It's Carol, but where is her hair? Hey, Sarah, but you don't recognize me. Anyway, you know that I've been caring for Jeff all these years. Well, he passed away a few months ago and only three days after his funeral, I was diagnosed with cancer. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, Carol. But get a load of this. You know, Tara has been caring for Daniel for all these years, who's also had brain tumor with Neil. Well, about six months ago, he passed away. And only eight weeks later, she was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis. Their sons, her son's already caring for her. She's already in a wheelchair. That's awful. You would think that these women need a break after all that they've been through for caring for years. But then Carol looked at me. But you know what, Sarah? You've been caring for Neil for eons. You look really good. What are you doing differently? It was then that I realized, yeah, I hadn't been good at all. But then I found ways to look after myself and and to actually improve my life and, and, and also for my health and well-being. And I started to jot that down. So I'm actually just going to share my screen with you guys. Here we go. And somehow, there we go. Bring that up. So that's when I actually started to write, who cares how to care for yourself whilst caring for a loved one. It has a lot of things like psychology and science in there as well, not just for carers, but for, for you, for, you know, even after caring to make sure that you are okay. And it became a bestseller, which is wonderful on Amazon. And it even won uh, the People's Book Prize uh, last summer, which is great because it's getting it out there for those caring for loved ones and raising awareness for what is needed for those caring. And I've been in the newspapers and magazines and given a lot of talks and webinars over the years, which has been really great, really powerful to make sure we're getting the message out there to make sure you look after yourself. Now, on the 6th of September, 2015, Neil had another stroke, just after we've been to the rugby actually, and he actually passed away in my arms. And I said, thank you. I really did say thank you. I was thank thankful for Neil being in my life. I loved him immensely. But also thank you for him passing because he'd been suffering for too long. And I had also with him, because we do, don't we? And compassion actually means to suffer with. And as a carer, you, we all suffer, don't we? We suffer with our loved ones as we go through it with them. And this is how I would describe it for all of us caring. Life is not about abstaining and enduring. It's still about enjoying your life. These are your days, your years too, especially if you're a carer. So it is really important that you do find that time. Not easy, I know, at times. I'm fully aware of that. So it's about checking in with yourself. And as I was, my health was deteriorating whilst caring, I actually thought I was coping, as I said, but actually I wasn't. And this is how I would describe it. I describe it as being comfortably uncomfortable. You know, you've got that kind of bubbling anxiety. We're in that kind of fight or flight response. And I call it the care, CRM, carer's response mode. You're always kind of like looking out, making sure for the next crisis, you know, making sure everybody else is okay. You're just constantly doing that. And your neural pathways are constantly looking out instead of actually looking and, you know, relaxing, enjoying yourself. It's, it's very difficult. That, carer response mode. And as carers, we need to check in with ourselves regularly because often for many of us, we suppress our emotions, ignoring our own health. So regularly checking in with yourself 
helps you to make better decisions for all people. So it helps you stop falling ill as well, which includes you because you are key, you're pivotal to every decision that is made. But often we just give our power away very quickly to be there for everybody else. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions. So whilst you're sat there, just have a think when I ask you these questions and maybe jot some points down if you've got a pen and paper. So my first question is, how are you feeling? And we're gonna go in deep, dig deep on this. So firstly, how are you feeling mentally? And as thoughts are the language of the brain, we have something like 70,000 thoughts a day, a lot of thoughts. Many of our thoughts are negative thoughts and they are on a loop. What thoughts are you having on a regular basis? What things are you thinking about? A lot of things that we think about, you know, awful things, never even happen. But which, which that's such a waste of day, isn't it? At the end of the day, but you know, we, we're constantly putting ourselves in that fight or flight of worrying about things. So what kind of thoughts are coming up for you? Are they positive or negative? What thoughts are not serving you? And like I say, I was thinking about family when I was on that silent retreat and my, and my anger, it was physically impacting my body. We just don't realize. Well, first, secondly, how are you feeling emotionally? What kind of emotions are coming up for you right now? Whereas thoughts are the language of the brain, emotions are the language of the body. But as carers, we often suppress and ignore our emotions, but these are a great signal if something is doing us good or draining. You know, it's something like that gut feeling. You know when somebody is putting on you, right? But often we don't really say anything, but that is the time to say something. If somebody's putting on you or causing you some grief or, oh, you know, I can't, I don't want to say yes, but I do. Notice that, you know, notice those feelings in your body. They are a great sign. How do your emotions make you feel? Notice that. And remember that actually this is great with the Heart Math Institute in the States. I love this. Your heart actually holds neurons. So when you're making decisions, often we're making it from here, from the head, and we can, you know, we can be quite critical and quite, you know, hard on ourselves, beating ourselves up. But actually, if you go to your heart and you can put your hands on your heart when you're making decisions, your heart holds neurons and you make a decision from your heart, it will always tell you the right answer. It really does. Finally, how are you feeling physically? Thoughts and feelings, if they go unchecked, end up impacting our bodies. And stress can build up unnoticed. And that's the trouble with this whilst caring. You know, you, it just builds up bit by bit until we finally snap or, or crack, basically. And continued stress can put suppress our immune system. So it's about relieving and making sure that you're okay and taking time out. We'll be talking about that shortly. Too many carers ignore their own health, even canceling appointments. Is that something that you do? It's not easy, I know, when you're trying to be there for yourself, for loved ones, but sometimes it is about boundaries and pushing back knowing where to say no to make sure that you are okay. You need to make sure you're, you're all right. So ways to check in. Firstly, so what I did after I'd fallen ill, my neighbor, Nadia, she's great, good friend of mine as well. She's a carer as well. So we'd meet on a Sunday evening, have a cup of tea, and we'd talk about how we've been feeling that week. So we'd check in once a week. And it's something maybe you could do too meeting with a good friend, maybe a fellow carer, somebody who, who understands and has your best interest at heart, has a, a deeper understanding of what you're going through. And we talk about how things have been, have I felt better or have I felt worse this week? And two heads are better than one, of course. So you think about what can I do differently about a particular situation? Because of course I know there's always situations arising whilst we're caring, I know that for a fact. But yeah, just checking in with yourself regularly. Of course, you could do it in person or over the phone or maybe Zoom or Skype that we can do now. A lot of us, of course, are doing a lot more Zooming, which is absolutely brilliant. So at least we can connect in regularly. 
or is something that we were talking about right at the beginning, weren't we, was journaling as we were waiting for, for some of you coming in. Journaling is great. I learned this from a, a fellow carer. And it's just a fancy name for a, a notepad and a pen, but actually jotting down how you're feeling. What have I noticed that's been causing me grief? What can I do about the situation? Sometimes there's things you can't do. Some things are out of our control, but we, it's still down to us how we choose to react to that and how we take something on board. Say somebody gives you a sharp criticism or is unpleasant. It's up to us how we deal with it. I now kind of almost physically push back and go, well, that's their stuff. That's not me. I'm doing my best. I can only do my best. I can't please everybody all of the time. None of us can. Okay. So my next um, kind of sharing is about your support network. And your support network is key. And it's wonderful that you're here today and with the charity doing great work. Really important because they have a deeper level of understanding. So I'm just going to share a quick story with you. When I fell ill and I finally came back, my good mate, Joe came to see how I was doing because you know I'd not been very good. And we were stood here in the kitchen actually having a cup of tea and Neil was tucked up in his bed in the living room. And I said, you know what, Joe? I can care for Neil, it's full on and it's 24 seven nursing care with the help of paid carers. I said, but a couple of things that really scuppered me was a family member and a, a friend of mine they could see that I'm caring for a terminally ill husband, but still they put on me and were quite unpleasant and quite nasty at times. Jo looked at me. It's funny, she said, my mother-in-law comes out with this great phrase, people are like taps or drains. Taps in your life are people who fill you up and make you feel better. You usually have a lot of empathy and a lot of love. And drains, well, drains just drain you. They can't, they're usually people who can't see beyond their nose and they've got their own things going on and they're just not going to give you that empathy and support. Oh, do you know what? This was just music to my ears. It was like a eureka moment for me because I've been expecting these two people to think and feel like me. They weren't like me at all. They weren't an empath and they didn't have compassion. And I'd been expecting that they had, but they didn't. In that moment, I actually emotionally let them go. And that's what I did. I let them go. And with that, my life started to improve. Actually, Joe actually left a few minutes later because I loved the taps and drains analogy, analogy so much. I got a sheet of paper, sat at the desk, drew a line down the middle of this sheet of paper, taps, drains at the top. And over the next five, 10 minutes, I started to write down all those in my life, friends, family, colleagues, anybody. And I thought, tap, drain, tap, drain, which one are they? Because it really caught me out. And by the end of that, I sat back and looked at this extensive list. Oh my God, Sarah, look at all the taps in your life. Really long list. But you know what? It was a real eye opener to see who was draining and been draining me. Absolutely fascinating, it's something you could try yourself. Really interesting. And I think drains, they're not bad people, but sometimes they're going through their own issues, they don't have had as much love, that they can't see beyond themselves to go, oh, I wonder how you're doing, how are you coping? They're just not in that way. And, and I've got a few family members who clearly have the empath chip removed. And you probably know people in your family as well who are not quite as loving and as giving. Like there's a few nods I can see. So, <clears throat> taps and drains. It's good to be aware of who fills you up and who depletes you. Notice that. Maybe you can keep a little bit more at arm's length from those who are a bit more draining. If you probably might be even living with somebody who can be at times draining. It's just noticing it. And it's obviously it's down to us how we react. And if there are certain people who drain you, could you spend less time with them? And then do something afterwards that fills you up. Are you able to spend more time with taps? And I really then did start to surround myself with the taps in my life. You could do as I did write your list, just become more aware. It's really powerful, it makes a big difference for you. And it's not just people that can drain you. When you've visited certain places, which fill you up and which leave you feeling drained, 
I know spending a whole day at the hospital with Neil when he was having chemo, really draining, very draining, very tiring. So then fill yourself up afterwards, have something for you to make yourself feel better when you've been drained. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about taking a break. I'll let you get that, Sue Ramesh wants to come in. So taking a break, taking a break is really powerful and really important. <laughs> Sue, do you mind admitting? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I can't do it because I'm sharing my screen. Thank you. Take a break. Okay. Because getting into the outside space helps us deal with the inside space. So remember when I was on that silent retreat, in getting away from the situation at home and everything that's going on, because you're busy in that doing stage, when you get away and you have a break, you can see the wood for the trees. And it actually starts to help you to even just go for a walk up the road. It really does. Go, right, how am I feeling? What can I do? What do I want to do more of? What do I want to do less of? So it's really important to have a regular break. Having time out. We all need regular breaks. I know it's not always easy when you're caring, but so do you. Make sure you factor that time in for you every day. But as, as I said, many of us feel guilty for having time out or seeing friends, but you're also here for you. I turned down respite care. I don't know, if, I see a few of you. Raise your hand if you've turned down respite care when it's been offered. I have, and then I fell ill. And then Julia said to me, it's too late when you've fallen ill, Sarah, to have respite care. Carers need regular breaks. And it's down to us to make sure that we factor it in as well. Back to time in, it might just be 10 minutes between chores or half an hour, but rest up and go and do something for you to fill yourself up. Otherwise, if you just do this or just do that, you just fall into bed worn out at the end of the day. And is there friends or family you haven't seen for a while? I remember not going back for a whole year of not seeing my family because I was too busy engrossed in caring for Neil. Then my grandfather died <clears throat> while I was on the silent retreat. And I, I could have gone and seen him. That really upset me. And I realized I was putting all my love into one basket and missing out on seeing certain family. It's really important that we factor that in. Ask about respite or befrienders. I had, it's quite amusing, but she, I had Brenda the befriender, I know, uh, who came and kind of hang out with Neil. And she became really good friends for us. She's still a friend of mine today. And if friend, family can't offer off respite, Ask various charities around your area. There's a lot of befriending that's happening, which is really wonderful. Gives you a little break, but gives them, you know, your loved one, you might not be seeing too many people these days. Gives them a chance to sit with somebody else. Kind of shakes it up a little. In having time out, puts us in a better state of mind to make better decisions for all. Really powerful. Now, finally, I want to say that you are amazing. You probably don't feel it sat there if you're looking at me, but I, I'm telling you, you are. You are amazing because not everybody can do what you do. Many walk. I've spoken to those who could have cared for their loved one. I think one particular who could have cared for her husband with a brain tumour. She packed her bags and left. I've heard a number of stories that, like that. But to sit there and be there and give your love, your time and your compassion is very powerful. It keeps people alive. It keeps them going. So recognize all that you do, value your worth. I just wanna share this story. I gave a talk at the Houses of Parliament a number of years ago when I had Neil still with me. And uh, it was for the Brain Tumor Charity, raising awareness for them. And after I'd spoken, the neurosurgeon got up and he spoke and he said he was often asked, what was the best criteria for surviving a brain tumor? Very powerful because for many people, it's 18 months if you're lucky. And he said, and I kind of sat there and thought, well, it's probably the latest chemo or gamma knife or whatever that is for, for brain tumors. But his answer surprised us all. He said the best criteria for surviving a brain tumor was marital status. And I love this. And I personally don't think that you need to be married. But I think if you've got somebody 
being there for you, fighting their, you know, fighting their corner, researching, looking what else there can be there for them. It's very powerful knowing that you're like a pillar of strength. You're being an emotional and physical rock for that person. It really does keep, keep people going. Sometimes keeps them going, keeps them alive for years longer. And also it gives them a reason to live, the love of another, which is... So we're not taught, taught to kind of value what we do, do we? But it, it's very powerful. I reckon, and I'm going to be really honest with you, Neil went downhill rapidly when I had rest, when he went into the hospice for respite care. He was in there for three weeks because they wouldn't give him a safe discharge. He went downhill so rapidly. I, I don't think he'd have lasted a few months. And, that, and then he lived seven years longer. I think if it had been there, that would have been it. So I know that my love, my care and attention for him kept him going for much, much longer. So recognize all that you do, value your worth. I just wanna share briefly with you Carers Masterclass, which is happening at the moment. I've got Carers on it. And this is um, actually Jackie gave, Jackie Darlington who's here today. She, I, I was giving it actually um, live, but it's actually pre-recorded, so you can just watch it in your own time. So, which is great because you might, there might be a week or two where you just think, well, I ain't got time for that. But so it's there, so you can watch it as and when you want to. And this is the Wheel of Wisdom. So it's five key areas, if you like, that I go into. And it's about creating greater clarity. Because, because often, if you don't know what's going on around you and how you're treating yourself, you can't make those changes for the better. But with this, you can. It is about creating a greater level of consciousness. And then it's about taking back control. Often we feel like we're out of control, don't we? Everything's happening to us and around us. But actually, there's certain things that we can pull it in and make sure that we are managing our time, our energy better. And even trips to the hospital and doctors, just simple little things can really take away a lot of stress. And of course, I've been talking today about your connection. Your support network is key. And I talk about a lot more of that in detail, of making sure you have that right support around you. And I talk about core, not just your own health and well-being, but some of the things I did differently for Neil. And actually, I gave him a supplement and, and he'd been a body in a bed for months. I gave him one supplement and it's like he woke up. Amazing for his brain, food for his brain. He started talking to me. That was nuts. I nearly fell over sideways. Out of the blue. And finally, cloud nine. It's about your life and actually still enjoying your life with whatever is going on around, you know, because it's been a tough time for everybody. So this is five encompassing five key areas of your life, helping you to manage your life and others so you get the best results and empowers you to look after your own health and well-being whilst enjoying your life and valuing your worth. So we dive deep. There's psychology and things in here, which are not particularly just for carers, but I went, oh, I love this. This really works. Things by Carl Jung and Dr. Stephen Cartman, absolutely love it. And it inspires you and motivates you to keep you going. Much of what you'll learn, you'll learn for the rest of your life. And it's already been delivered at a Carers Richmond Centre, so which has been really wonderful. And I've seen great shifts in carers, and I do at the moment. Pre-recorded, and there's a Facebook group. And I will be, um, I also give a Zoom call once a fortnight. The next one's happening this Monday, if you want to join, join and, and come on board. Um, but you can leave the, the um, the camera off like we do today. So you can be anonymous or ask questions, you know, anonymously afterwards. It really is up to you how you want it. And there's not a course like this out there. This course has been made for you. It's what I would have needed when I was caring for Neil for those 13 years. And so I've been getting some great results and the carers have been absolutely loving it. Sharina cared for her sister and she was actually really angry when she turned up when I basically delivered it at, at Richmond Carers Centre. And I, I give us something called a task shifter at the end of each session. And it helps to change your neural pathways, but pleasure seeking, because often we're just looking for crises, you know, being in that carer's response mode. But with this, it's actually getting you to change your neural pathways for the better so that you're actually feeling better and noticing what you want to do more of to make yourself feel better. And she, she loved it. She said there's so much support and offered with a um, with a well thought out plan of survive the trials and tribulations, which often is overwhelming for us, isn't it? And Barbara caring for her 
daughter, she really loved it as well. She actually said, I loved doing this course, which is really great. So three actions for you guys today. I know some of you, I've noticed you've been jotting things down, which is really good. Regularly check in with yourself. Notice how you're feeling, how you could do that, either with journaling or one-on-one -on -one with a friend or just ask, can I just ring you for 10 minutes on a Sunday evening, mum or, for, you know, a friend, just something that you can put in place so you catch yourself, so you're not finding yourself here on this kind of descent, which many of us find that we're experiencing. Take those regular breaks, whether it's 10 minutes here, half an hour, or if you can get an afternoon off, go for it. You know, don't feel guilty. You need to make sure that you recoup and rest and have some joy in your life too. Give yourself permission to do at least one thing for yourself each day. Really powerful. Just starting to notice yourself doing that. Even if you wake up every morning and go, well, what am I going to do today to give myself permission? Just if you do that each morning, it, it starts to put you on the up and sort of going, oh, what am I doing? You know, that needs doing, this needs doing. I know there's always a sea of choice. I'm fully aware of that. And I'm just going to come out of here now and um, stop sharing my screen. And what I'm going to do, stop sharing. I'm just going to put a couple of links in the chat and send those to you. So you can see Charismas. So have a look at it if you fancy joining on, for, on board. I've also put my uh, website in there as well. So you can... Yeah, if you, you can click on there and, and see the book and stuff and just read a bit more about the course. It's a little purple strip across my homepage, a bit further down. And I'd just like to hear from you guys as well. What's been coming up for you? What have you been noticing? Anything that I've been talking about? I'd love to hear what's been happening for you of late. Thank you, Sarah. Can I just say a big thank you for, for delivering that? I think it was incredibly compelling to hear your journey and very, very powerful messages in terms of kind of putting yourself first and not putting your life on hold, I think was really, really strong, wasn't it? And having that one positive thing for yourself each day. So I'd like to say a really big thank you to you. I'm going to just stop the recording now before we take questions, okay? Thank you, Sue.